thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Stephen Rosen. I'm the hearing officer today, and this, this is going to be fairly informal. We want everybody who signed up to get their statement. The way it's going to work is we do have a court report. It's Deanna here. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And she will be taking down testimony of anyone who wants to speak who's on the list. We have a list here. It's about 30 people on it. I'm going to allow everyone five minutes or less, depending on what they want to say, no more than five minutes to give me their uh, speech tonight. We're going to start with <clears throat> Mr. Knudsen, who is the lawyer for the school district. He's going to give you guys something. Uh, be nice. And then the superintendent's going to talk. And after that, the public. If you folks have evidence, so to speak, that you want me to take into consideration, you will leave it here and I will put it in the record. Uh, and I want to see everything you have, okay? Just so you know, I have no clue what's going on. I've not talked to anybody about this. I just want to hear what's going on, what's, what's happening, and then I'm going to make a decision later on. All right? So, Mr. Knudsen, go ahead. Uh, good evening. I, I, I've been told, well, let me ask a question. I've been told by my kids that I've talked to you. Yes, you are. Good evening. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I told you I was alone. <laughs> Well, what, I, what I'm going to do is, for purposes of the record, I'm going to go through and identify the school district exhibits for purposes of this proceeding. I'm then going to make a short, and for me, a very short opening statement, at which point then I will be going through uh, with Superintendent Tam Tammy the information on behalf of the school district. And, uh, and I just want to say that, that Anybody who signed up has, has a, a right to talk. Uh, however, that doesn't come until that particular part of this proceeding. And so I will not be responding to any questions by any member of the public during the course of this hearing. Uh, so first I want to go through and I will give a copy of the exhibits to the hearing officer and to the court reporter. And I will try to go through them as efficiently as possible. Exhibit number one is an affidavit of publication uh, indicating that the notice for this particular proceeding was published in the uh, legal newspaper of the school district for two successive weeks, uh, one on March 17th and one on March 24th. Exhibit number two is the minutes of, or, I don't know that they've been approved, but the draft minutes of the board meeting uh, of the school board itself, Coach Chain Reading River School District, which for the purpose of this hearing, I will just refer to as the school district, uh, for the meeting that was held on March 8th of this year. Exhibit uh, number three is the information packet that was provided by the superintendent to the school board for the meeting on March 8th of 2023. Exhibit four is a facility and budget report uh, that was prepared by Superintendent Jeremy Tanning. Exhibit number five is a portion of the school district's final year in audit for the uh, year ending in June 30th of 2018. School district exhibit six is certain portions of the school district's audit for school year ending on June 30th, 2019. School District Exhibit 7 is certain portions of the school district's audit that was completed on June, or for this year, this year, year ending June 30th, 2020. School District Exhibit Number 8 is certain portions of the audit that was done for the school district for the year ending uh, June 30th, 2021. School District Exhibit 9 is certain portions of the audit for the school district uh, for the year ending June 30th of 2022. Uh, school District Exhibit 10 is a, an agenda for a school board meeting that was held on June 17th of 2020. School District Exhibit number 11 are certain portions of the school district's audit for the school year ending June 30th, 2014. School District Exhibit number 12 is a copy of the 
North Mall High School Mustang Express, dated September 21st of 2022. Uh, school District Exhibit 13 is a copy of the local newspaper showing the public notice that was published for this hearing. School District Exhibit number 14 is a copy of the publication uh, indicating that the public, uh, public notice was published on uh, March 14th. School District Exhibit number 15 is a copy of the special election ballot for the bond issue that went to the voters on April 13th, 2021. School District Exhibit 16 is a, a document prepared by ARI, who were the school district architects at the time, uh, dated March 9, 2020, regarding the North Home Indus Indoor Air Quality Project. School District Exhibit number 17 is a copy of the minutes from the school board meeting on June 17th of 2020. School District Exhibit number 18 is a copy of the minutes of the school board meeting held on May 13th, 2020. School District Exhibit number 19 is a copy of the minutes of a work session held by the school board held on June 29th, 2022. School District Exhibit number 20 is a copy of the Minnesota Department of Education Flexible Learning Year application for 23-24. School District Exhibit number 21 is a copy of an article that appeared in the Minneapolis Star Tribune on Thursday, March 30th, 2023. School District Exhibit 22 is a copy of Minnesota Statutes 123B.51, and it is subdivision five of that statute that governs the hearing that is being held today. School District Exhibit number 23 is a copy of Minnesota Statutes 123.81, which details statutory operating debt. School District Exhibit number 24 is a report from the Minnesota Department of Education showing the square footage of both the North Home and the Indus School Buildings. School District Exhibit number 25 is a document that sets forth the respective enrollments of both the Indus and the North Home School Year, or School District, or School Brother, uh, from the 2016-17 school year through the 2022-23 school year, and it is broken down by resident students that were enrolled in each of those schools during those school years and non-resident students. School District Exhibit number 26 is a copy of Senate file number 771. School district exhibit number 27 is a copy of House file number 13.48. And school district exhibit number 28 is uh, a copy uh, of a document regarding levy uh, limitations and levy certification that's issued by the Minnesota Department of Education. So those are the exhibits that the school district intends to um, use during the course of this year. I now want to give a brief opening statement. Uh, this hearing is being held pursuant to Minnesota Statutes 123B.51 on the question of the necessity and practicality of the proposed closing of the Indus School. The published notice, which was published for two successive weeks in the legal newspaper of the school district, states that the proposed closing of the Indus School is being considered for the following reasons. Declining enrollment, insufficient revenues for the school district, cost savings to the school district when the school is closed, and any other reasons which fit the facts of the situation. Now, I know because I was the one that prepared the original public notice, that in the original notice, that the address is correct for the school, but it did indicate that it was in Lake, that it was in Lake of the Woods County. The confusion with respect to that, which certainly was not intentional, is that when you look up the address for the end of school, it says that the, the uh, school is in Baudette. That's what the address says. Unfortunately, Baudette is in Lake of the Woods County. The school itself is in Kuchichi. And uh, the address was changed to what uh, my understanding is by the U.S. Postal Service, of which I, nor the, neither I nor the school district had any control, approximately a year or so. Uh, now, the, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, the school district is somewhat unique. Uh, 
Number one, geographically speaking, it's a rather large school district. Uh, and number two, it also has two K through 12 schools, which I can tell you from my uh, getting close to 40 years of experience in practicing school law in the state of Minnesota, and now I've just made myself feel old rather than I feel old. But in any event, uh, there, there are two, two schools. And for a school district this size to have two schools is somewhat unusual. It's even more unusual that for a school district this size to have two K through 12 schools. Ordinarily, what you will see is that school districts this size, if they have two buildings, they may have one elementary building and they may have one secondary building. But this school has two K through 12 buildings. But probably the most unique feature of the, this school district is the distance between the two schools, which is 82 miles. Now, that, that's a haul. I, I think everyone would agree with that. Now, the school district's presentation will be primarily done through its superintendent, Jeremy Tan, who is right now seated to my left. Now, during the course of this present, or his presentation, superintendent uh, Tammy will show a number of things. Number one, he will show that for nine of the last 10 school years, the school district has deficit spent. And what deficit spent means, or deficit spending, is that you are, the, the district is spending more money than it's taking in. And so for nine of the last uh, 10 school years, the district has been deficit spending. Now the only year that the district, of that, of that period, that the district didn't deficit spend was the 2019-20 school year. Now, as we all know, during the 2019-20 school year, we had the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result of that, because of school districts, including the South Bridge Street Green School District, had to go to virtual learning for several months near the end of the school year, which enabled the school district to save money that it otherwise not, would not have been able to for things such as transportation and other things. Now, Superintendent Tammy will also show that as a result of this deficit spending, the school district's unassigned general fund balance. Now, what an unassigned general fund balance is, because school districts get revenues from, from various sources, some you can only use for a specific purpose. That's all you can use for. The unassigned general fund balance is what you, you can use it for pretty much anything. In any event, uh, the, the school district went from an unassigned general fund balance at the end of the 2013-14 school year to a four million $853,413 to approximately $2.4 million by the end of the current school year. Now that is a reduction of 50% of the school district's uh, unreserved general fund funds over just over a nine year period. Superintendent Tammy will also state that continuing on that path will not be sustainable for the school district. Superintendent Tammy will also show that currently the school district has an annual peer pupil expenditure for in the schools. In other words, that's the amount of money that the district has to pay for each student in the, being educated in this building of $26,336. However, in comparison, the amount, of the annual expenditure per pupil in the North Home building is $20,092, which is a difference of over $6,000 per student. Superintendent Tammy will also show that enrollment is declining in the school district, and that over the past three school years, uh, with that decline, primarily, if not uh, solely, being experienced at the end of school. Superintendent Tammy will further show that based on census data, it is clear that such declines in enrollment are not something that's going to go away, that they are going to continue for years to come. The effects of declining enrollment is that the school district will have less revenue coming in because a lot of the revenue that school districts receive is based on the number of students that they have. Superintendent Tammy will also show that in order to reduce expenditures, to protect the long-term viability of the school district and to deal with the insufficient revenues of the school district, the school district needs to close the end of school. 
Superintendent Kathy will show that a number of factors support, support the closing of the end of school as opposed to the North Hall, North Hall School. And these factors include, include rather, that the, the decline in enrollment is again primarily related to the end of school. The pupil, curve pupil expenditures at the end of school are significantly higher than those of the North Hall School. The comparative capital improvements for the Indus School and the North Home School indicate the cost of such improvements over the next few years are approximately $300,000 more for the Indus School. The, uh, in addition, the North Home School has more capacity to absorb students for the, that, that are currently attending the Indus School. <laughs> That's okay, right through. Uh, another, one, uh, another reason is the increased cost of transporting the students from the Indus School to the North Home School is significantly greater than the cost of transporting students from the North Home School to the Indus School. And the cost savings of the Indus, of closing the Indus School for uh, far exceed any cost savings for closing the, the, the North Home School. In fact, people, people testify that the school district will save over half a million dollars by closing the Indus School, whereas closing the North Home, the North Home School, they actually generate $500,000 more in revenue than what they expend on an average year. So in conclusion, I know that closing a school is a very hard decision. And some of you may not believe this, but I believe that the, the, the school board as a whole takes this very, very seriously. It can be a very, very emotional decision. But sometimes, quite frankly, because of the, the circumstances, and I think this is one of them, it's something that has to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Correct. So over an 11 period, 
11 year period, the county experienced a population decline of 1,120 people, correct? Correct. Which is a decline of 7.8%. That's correct. Now, it, the 2021 census, which was 10 years after, uh, obviously after the 2011 census, 11,941 people recorded to be living in the county, correct? That's correct. So comparing that to the 2000 census, the county experienced a population decline of 2,414 people, correct? Correct. Which is a decline of approximately 16.8% of the total population over a 21 year period. Correct. Out of the 11,941 people living in the county in 2021, how many of those lived in the city of International Falls? 5,718. And is International Falls within the South Coast Chain Rainbow School District? No. So approximately 48% of the total population in the county reside outside of the school district. Correct. And is, is uh, International, International Falls has their own school district, correct? Right? That's correct. Is there any other school district in South Coaching County uh, other than uh, North Home, Brady River? Yes, one other school district, Little Fork, Big Falls. So they also have students that uh, reside within the county that do not reside within the South Coaching County School District. Correct. Now let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into the census data. For school-aged children, and that's children 5 through 19 year old, the 2010 census shows that there were 2,470 that were living in the county, correct? Correct. And 11 years later, this number decreased by 583 students to 1,887, which is a decrease of 23.6%, correct? Correct. And I want to refer you to page 5 of the report. Uh, projections for future declines in population um, of the county show that Cochichin County is expected to, uh, that their population is expected to decline by 41.2%, correct? Correct. And over what period is that decline expected to occur? Um, we're looking at uh, between 2018 to 2053. And that's reflected on page six of exhibit four, correct? Correct. Let's talk about declining enrollment. As the school district enrollment, or is the school district, in, uh, the student enrollment in the school district increasing, staying the same, or declining? It's declining. And over the past, Three school years, and that is uh, from the 2000 and 2020 to 2000 and, uh, the 2020-21 school year to the 2022-23 school year, uh, the enrollment in the school district has decreased totally from 281 students to 270 students, correct? Correct. And that's reflected on page seven of exhibit four, is it not? It is. And that's, an, uh, that's a decrease of 3.9% of the entire student body, is it not? Correct, it is. Now, is the, the declining enrollment kind of a new phenomenon for the school district? No, it's been going on um, for the past eight, nine years, at least that I know of. And I want to refer you to exhibit 10. And that again is a copy of the agenda for the June 17, 2020 board meeting. Uh, now, what the, the main topic of conversation at that meeting is listed as number five in the agenda in this elementary enrollment and teachers, right? Correct. Were you present at that meeting? I was. Okay, and attached to that, there's some information regarding enrollment. And then there's a, a document that's entitled ISD Annual Audit Report Deficit Spending. And it lists uh, deficit spending six years beginning in 2013-14 to 2018-19. Correct. And then also attached to that are uh, portions of the school district audit during those years, correct? Correct. And I want to refer you, and 
there's, unfortunately, it's a little confusing because there's two numbers on, on some of the documents. One is the number that was part of the, the school district's audit. The other one is for purposes of identification in this hearing. Um, the, the number that doesn't have the, the, the slashes on the side of it is the one for purposes of this hearing. But if you look at doc, or not, page eight, or six rather, and that's for the, the uh, school year ending June 30th of 2016, it indicates in there that the auditor indicates that the district's enrollment is also declining, correct? Correct. Now, is it surprising to see that the school district's enrollment is declining in light of the census data that's set off pages three through six of exhibit four? No, the data that we have um, from the census data supports the declining enrollment for the school district. And I want to refer you back to exhibit four again, and specifically page seven of exhibit four. And on that document uh, is listed the total enrollment in both, both buildings in the school district from the 2016-17 school year to the 2022-23 school year, correct? That's correct. And then there's also a breakdown of K through 12 enrollment by school for the past, for, for the school years 2016-17 uh, up to projections for the 2023-24 school year, correct? Correct. Now let's let's look at the enrollment figures, uh, and in fact, the projections uh, for student enrollment for the upcoming 2023-24 school year uh, shows that enrollment is projected to decline by another five students, correct? Correct. Let's look at the enrollment figures in a little bit more detail. Now, of, of the 260 K-12 students that were enrolled in the school district during the 2016-17 school year, 169 of those, or 65% of, uh, of, of the total, of, of that total rate, uh, attended North Home School, correct? Correct. That same year, the Indus School had 91, or 35% of the total, correct? Correct. And looking at it a little further, during the 2016-17 school year, and this is reflected uh, in, I believe it's on Exhibit 25, the, during the 2016-17 school year, the school district had a total of 114 resident students enrolled, correct? Correct. And of those 114 resident students, approximately 76% of those attending North Home and approximately 24% of those attending Indus, correct? Correct. Now let's move to the 2017-18 school year. And going again back to uh, Exhibit 4, in page 7, during that school year, uh, the total enrollment of the school district was 271 K-12 students, correct? Yes. And of that 271 students, 160, or 59% of those, attended North Home School, while the Indians had 111, or 41% of the total, correct? Yes. Again, referring you back to Exhibit 25, looking at it a little further, or a little deeper, rather, the school district during that particular school year had 104 total resident students enrolled, 75% of which attended North Home and 25% attended Indus. Correct. Now turning to the 2018-19 school year, again referring back to Exhibit 4, page 7, the school district had a total of 286 students enrolled, of which 181 of those, or 63% of the total, attended North Home School, while Indus had 105, or 37% of the total room, correct? Correct. And then going back to Exhibit 25, during that same year, the school district had 106 resident students enrolled, 77% of which attended North Home School, and 23% attended Indus, correct? Correct. 
Then looking at the 2019-20 school year, again, Exhibit 4, page 7, the school district had a total of 279 students that were intending to enroll in the school district, of which 180, or 64.5% of those attended North Home School, while in this had 99, or 35.5% of the total, correct? Correct. And I'm referring again to Exhibit 25, during that same school year, the school district had 113 resident students enrolled, 70.7% of which attended North Home, and 29.3% attended Indus, correct? Correct. Then turning to the 2021 school year, and back to Exhibit 4, uh, page 7, the school district had a total of 281 K-12 students who were enrolled, of which 181 of those, or 64.4% of those, attended North Home School, while Indus had 100, or 35.6% of the total, correct? 101. Okay, just the yeah. other. Oh, excuse me. And then going, looking at Exhibit 25, as far as resident students during that uh, the 2020-21 school year, the school district had 111 resident students enrolled, 78 percent of which attended North Home, and 22 percent attended Indus. Correct. And then for the 2021-22 school year, the school district had 2,000 or 278 K-12 students uh, that were enrolled. Uh, 177 of those, or 63.7 percent, attended North Home, while Indus had 101, or 36.3 of the total. That's correct. And I apologize. Your 100 before for Indus was correct. Okay. It's a good one. You're not telling me about She tells me I'm wrong most of the time. But anyway. Uh, then again, back to um, the 2000 and 21-22 uh, school year. Looking at Exhibit 25. During the two, that year, the school district had 123 resident students enrolled, 76.4% of which attended North Home School, and 23.6% of which attended Indus, correct? Correct. And now turning to the 2022-23 uh, uh, school year, which is the current school year, uh, the school district has 170, uh, rather 270 K-12 students enrolled, 178 of which were 66% uh, attend North Home School, while Indus had 92 or 34% of the total enrollment, correct? Yes. And again, referring you to, uh, uh, now to, uh, uh, again, to Exhibit 25, during that same year, the school district had 103 resident students enrolled, 84.4% uh, of which attended North Home School, and 15.6% attended Indus, correct? Correct. Now, for the upcoming school year, which is the 23-24 school year, uh, for purpose of the projections for K-12 enrollment, is that the total enrollment of the school district will have 265 students. 177, or 67%, will be attending North Home School, while Indus is projected to have 88 students, or 33% of the total, correct? Correct. And that's, uh, you find that on Exhibit 4 at page 10, is that correct? Correct. And looking at the projections again a little further, during the 23-24 school year, the school district is projected to have 109 resident students enrolled, 84% of which will be attending North Hall, and 16% uh, will be attending Indus. Is that correct? Correct. Now, there are certain things that you can take away from these enrolled things, are there not? You can. And since the 2018-19 school year, through the, uh, through the projected enrollment for 2023-24, the school district's total enrollment has declined by approximately 7.3%. Correct? Correct. And based on the census data, as you've already indicated, there's no reason to believe that that trend is not going to continue. That's right. And that trend is not going to, it, it, it's not going to cease for the foreseeable future. Is it? No, not according to the data. Also, during that same period, the decline in student enrollment has largely involved the Indus building, which has seen its enrollment decline by 16.2%, as opposed to North Home School's decline by 2.2%, correct? Correct. And that's in Exhibit 4, page 7. That is correct. Let's, let's turn to the financial condition of the school district. Would you say that the district 
district has had a history of deficit spending? Yes. Now, I know that in my brief opening statement, I did indicate what deficit spending is. Would you agree with how I characterized what deficit spending is? Yes, it's when you are spending more than revenue or money that you're taking in. Okay, and now I want to refer you uh, Exhibit 10, uh, specifically pages Exhibit 4, pages 14 and 15. Oh, for that. Okay. that shows that during the 2013-14 school year, the, de the school district had was deficit spending to the tune of $231,458, correct? Correct. And during the fifth, the fifth uh, the 2014-15 school year, the school district was deficit, deficit spending to the tune of $114,372. Correct. And for the 2015-16 school year, the school district was deficit spending to the tune of $163,426. Correct. And moving on to page 15 of Exhibit 4, uh, during the 2016-17 uh, school year, the school district was deficit spending to the tune of four, $143,425, correct? Right? Correct. And during the 2017-18 school year, the school district was deficit spending to the tune of $76,713. Correct. And during the 2018-19 uh, school year, the school district was deficit spending to the tune of $720,015, right? correct? Now, during the, the school year, the 2019-20 school year, actually the, the uh, revenues exceeded the expenses by $256,340, correct? Correct. And then back for the 2020-2021 school year, the school district deficit spent to the tune of $45,381, correct? Correct. And then for the fiscal year, or the 2021-22 school year, the school district deficit spent to the tune of $721,031. Correct. Now, the one year during that entire period that the school district did not deficit spend was the 2019-2020 school year. Correct? Correct. Can you explain why that was? Yes, most of us remember in the room the governor, governor of Minnesota issued an order, schools were canceled with in person learning. Um, we had to go to remote learning as a school district. Some of our staff, I would say that non licensed staff that were not working in the building, they were not being paid during that time. Um, athletics, the athletic costs, transportation costs for athletics. Um, that was all taken into consideration. That was uh, not existent at that time, too. So um, the expenditures during that time when school was shut down because of COVID-19, um, the expenditures during that three-month time span had, had decreased. Would you characterize that as a very unusual situation? Yes. <laughs> now, the, as a result of all this deficit spending. And I want to refer you to uh, school district exhibit number 11, which are certain excerpts from the uh, audit for the 2013-14 school year. And I want to specifically refer to you, refer you to the second page of that exhibit. What was the unassigned fund balance for the general fund at the end of the 2013-14 school year? $4,853,413. Okay. Now, now I want to refer you to um, Exhibit 9. And that is the portions of the school district's audit for the 2021-22 school year. And specifically, I want to refer you to the last page of that exhibit. What was the uh, unassigned fund balance for the general fund um, effective 
from June 3rd of 2022. $3,261,717. So that's a, a total decrease over a seven year period in the unreserved fund balance of $1,591,000. Six hundred and ninety-six dollars, correct? Correct. Now, for the current school year, two thousand twenty-two-twenty-three school year, um, the end of the year audit hasn't been done because we're not at the end of the school year, correct? Correct. Now, I want to refer you to the back to Exhibit Four, and specifically page sixteen. In, in the revised budget. 
And where did the, how much did the, the, the revenue, was it one project or two? Was it the, the, the roof replaced in both the North Home and the other building? Yes, they were in both the schools received new roofs in the neighborhood of $1.2 million. And what school year was that done? It was done just this past summer, so it would have been the end of fiscal year 22 and the beginning of fiscal year 23. And so the revised budget uh, also reflects that additional expenditure as well, correct? Correct. Now, the projected, or the, the projected deficit of $856,668, when you take that off of the unassigned general fund balance, that lowers the school district's unassigned general fund balance to $2,405,049, correct? Correct. And that's about a 50% decrease in the unassigned fund balance since the end of the 2013-14 school year, correct? Correct. Now, I'm going to refer you to page, or exhibit 50. The school district uh, went to the voters for a bond issue in the amount of five million four hundred ninety-five thousand dollars on April first, April two thousand twenty-one. Correct. Correct. And what that bond issue was for was for the repair, repair and replacement of roofing, and that's the, the, the replacement that you already talked about for both the North Home and the schools. Correct. Correct. And also for the construction and installation of various heating and ventilation improvements at both the Windows and North Home School. Correct. So the amount of that bond issue was intended to cover all those projects. That is correct. And how did how did you arrive at the figure of five million four hundred and ninety-five thousand for that purpose of that bond issue? School District Meetings and Architect, um, Architectural Resources Incorporated, in my opinion. Okay, so they, they estimated prior to the bond issue and prior to you formulating the question for the bond issue that it would cost $5,495,000 to do all that work. That is correct. Now, what happened with the bond issue? Uh, the bond, bond issue was contested and ultimately then did not pass. And what was the basis for it being contested? Uh, two bases, I believe. Number one was there was not clear notice of the election, and number two uh, related to absentee ballot voting. Did the, the, the bond issue initially pass? Yes. Did it pass by a wide margin, or was it close? It was fairly close, but it did pass. And so, you don't know do you, that if there hadn't been the notice issue and there hadn't been the absentee ballot issue, whether it would have passed in the first place in any I do not. Now I want to refer you to page 33 of exhibit 4. Correct. So you, you, you go out for bids 
for just the HVAC portion. And the, the lowest bid came in uh, just under $5.2 million. Correct. Yeah. Yes. 
So he went back to the last, and I hesitate to use the word normal, but the last normal year. That was this way you're doing it. Correct. And so you set out that the total expenditures for the in this building for that school year was $2,633,500.
the state of Minnesota. And looking at page 21 of Exhibit 4, uh, you indicate that moving on to the revenue side, the district receives approximately 87% of total revenue from state and local funds. That's correct. that 
Uh, it says we also have $53,029.25 remaining in COVID funds and a $20,000 grant to help offset the cost of the school years. Correct. Are, are, are those funds going to be available beyond the end of the school year? No. Uh, but the total of those two funds for the purposes of the 22-23 uh, school year is $73,029.25. Correct. And then you also have um, Title VI, which is uh, American Indian Revenue and American Indian Impact Aid. Correct? Yes, that's correct. You say it fluctuates yearly, but it's around $50,000. Correct. It just depends upon the number of students who qualify. Does it, it, but, it, it, but again, that's for a specific purpose. That is correct. So when you add up all those figures, the total revenue for the 2022-23 school year is projected to be um, $6,034,420.07, correct? Correct. And that is reflect reflected on page 30 of Exhibit 4. That's correct. Now you also go on to say the district also has some smaller revenue streams that come in, uh, such as athletic aids, donations, etc. Correct. Correct. And you go on, you go on to say that these smaller revenue streams will help bring our, and it goes on to page 31 of Exhibit 4, revenue projections closer to the revised fund uh, one revenue projections of six million eighty-three dollars and nine cents. Correct. And that's reflected uh, in the revised budget, which is in Exhibit 4, page 16. Correct. Let's talk about expenses for the 22 23 school year. And I want to refer you uh, back to page 16 of Exhibit 4. Now, it indicates that the expenditures for fiscal year 23, 6 million, uh, for the general fund, six million nine hundred thirty-nine thousand six hundred and seventy-seven dollars Correct. And that expenditure amount includes the $464,884 uh, remaining for the real roofing project. That's correct. So, according to this, again, it shows a uh, projected deficit of $856,660. Eight dollars. Correct. Now, if you don't include the roofing project, it's a deficit of three hundred ninety-one thousand seven hundred eighty-four. Correct. Correct. And after this current school year, you won't have anything coming out of the general fund for the roofing project. It will be completely paid. That is correct. So the effects on the end reserve general fund. After, at the, after the end of the 2022-23 school year, lower that to approximately $2,400,000. Correct. Now turning to 2023-24, which is the upcoming school, school year. Is there any indication that if the school district does not close the school, that there won't be further deficit spending in the 2023-24 school year? No, there's not. It's already, you already projected that enrollment is going to continue to decline, correct? Correct. And expenses will, will rise as well, won't they? Yes. Why is that? Inflationary costs. So, now, uh, this is quite a popular topic of conversation among school district folks. And that is that the legislature is currently in session, and that they are, there are proposals to increase the current formula allowance by 5% per year for the next school year and the year after that. Correct. What is the current um, formula? Current formula allowance for school districts. For the 22 23 school year, the formula allowance is 
So if you basically take 5% of that, it would be a $343 increase in the farm loans. Correct. Correct. 
So then, using the 295.20 um, adjusted pupil units, which is again based on 272 students, and you multiply that by the formula levels of $6,863, you come up with $2,025,957.60. Correct. So, to determine the additional amount of money that the school district would receive, <coughs> you take the adjusted pupil units, and we'll use 295.20, because that's in that particular exhibit. And you would multiply that by $7,206, which is the 6,863 times 105%. Correct? Right? Yes. And you come up with $2,127,200. Yes, that's correct. Right. Now, you then have to find out what the increase in, that you're going to receive. Uh, you have to subtract the amount that you received the previous year. Correct. And so you have to subtract the $2,025,957.60. Correct. So, assuming, again, 270, uh, uh, 272 students, the increase that uh, funding that the district would receive because of the 5% increase would be $101,253.60. Correct. But that's not the increase that you're going to receive for the next school year because it is based on 272 students. Right. So you have to back out then the amount that you receive. Um, for that for those additional seven students. That's correct. And if you do that, and you just use the, you, you take $6,863, which is the amount uh, of the, the formula currently, and you multiply that by seven, that is, comes out to $48,041. Correct. And so you have to, Subtract that $48,041 from the $101,253.60 to see what to see what is the additional funding that you will receive for the next school year. Correct. And that amount would be $53,212.60. Correct. Correct. 
Uh, but just using that seven, uh, what you do is you take the seven thousand five hundred sixty-six thousand thirty cents. You multiply that by seven, and you come up with fifty-two thousand nine hundred sixty-four dollars and ten cents. Which you have to subtract from the hundred six thousand three hundred sixty thousand or hundred six thousand three hundred sixty thousand fifty-four cents, and you end up with an, uh, uh, an annual increase of fifty-three thousand three hundred ninety-six thousand forty-six cents. That is correct. Now, don't get me wrong, the increase in funding is with them, correct? It is, yes. Uh, but is, are those amounts really going to do uh, anything appreciable as far as getting the school district out of deficit spending? No. So, let's now. Page 
verde.
process of revenue uh, next year will be free breakfast and lunch. Okay, but according to the to the uh, uh, the budget, the revenue and the the uh, expenditures wash and wash up. Right. But did you have to pay this? Uh, so the one thing that you you wouldn't have to do. Oh, excuse me. What about community revenue or community service? You can add community service. There are some salaries that are included in that number. Okay. And so for that, you end up with. Six million five hundred sixty-nine thousand two hundred seventy-eight dollars. Correct. Correct. Now, do you, do you anticipate that uh, next year that uh, salaries are going to remain the same? No, they typically go up about two and a half to three percent. What about inflation? Three um, percent, possibly higher. So you back to. You, you indicate that you, uh, uh, you've cleaned, uh, I believe, a 3% salary inflation increase. Yes, on top of the 6,569,000. And, and that amounts to 197,078, correct? Correct. And if you do, and 
and you, you continue to, to experience this deficit spending, at some point, you're going to be statutory average. Correct. Correct. Everybody is statutory average. So in the state then will come in and take over a school district, tell the school board, superintendent, um, what needs to be done in order to get yourself um, back into the black per se, so you are not spending more than what you are taking in. And how many years, based on the current level of deficit spending, do you anticipate that the school district is it's going to take for the school district to get into statutory average? Four to five. So, now you've got two schools. You've got North Home and you got Indians. The question is, you need to close one, which I think is the, the financial uh, situation of the district will be the best um, The question is, which school do you close? You agree with that, don't you? That's the question? Yes. Now, which now, yeah. the end of school, you've already indicated that it costs $26,336 per pupil per year to educate the students at the end of the school. Correct. Your goal is $20,092 per year. Correct. So, considering that, which school do you think should be closed? I would like to say that data and evidence support closing the end of school. Now, both buildings need capital improvements, do they not? Correct. And you've already testified regarding the IAQ fundraise? Yes. And based on the dates that came in, it's, it's about $5.2 million, the lowest bid? Yes. And how, would, would that be split basically pretty much evenly between Indus and, and uh, North Home? Yes. That would be about $2.6 million per? Yes. Um, now, the end of school is going to need a new sewer system within the next year or two, correct? Right? Yeah, that's correct. And the cost for that, um, I'm going to refer you to page 33 of Exhibit 4. You indicate that the estimated cost of a new sewer system will run in the neighborhood of $350,000 to $400,000. Correct. So when you add those capital expenditures or improvements together, you come up with anywhere between two million nine hundred fifty thousand and three million dollars, right? Correct. And that's just over the next uh, by two thousand twenty-five. Right. Now let's look at North. Again, the IAQ upgrades is basically fifty-fifty, so that's twenty-six hundred dollars. And I'd like to refer you to page. Uh, 34 of Exhibit 4. Uh, it also indicates that um, they say that since the North Home building is a multi level, uh, is multi level, an elevator is required by law. Yes. The current elevator is 44 years old, and according to the oldest elevator engineers, the elevator will also need to be replaced at a cost of $70,000 80000 Correct. And you, you want to say the scoreboards in the North Home Gymnasium will need to be replaced prior to the 23 to 24 basketball season at a cost of about 20000 Correct. And why do you have to replace the scoreboards? Minnesota State High School League has instituted a new shot clock rule that will go in effect for the 23 24 season. And so that brings the, the total capital improvements over the next few years for North Home at $2,690,000 to $2,700,000, correct? Correct. Now just for purpose of clarification, if, if, if you ended up closing the North Home School, you'd have to replace the scoreboards at Indus. Yeah. Yeah. If they were a basketball team, oh, correct. So the, the, the necessary improvements for Indus could see those for North Home in just the next couple of years by about $300,000. Correct? Yeah, correct. Now let's talk about building capacity. Now I'm referring you to exhibit.
Exhibit 24. This is a, a information that the school district obtained uh, through the Bureau of Traffic. And according to this, the total square footage of the North Home building is 114,487 feet, right? Yeah? Square feet, correct. Uh, and, and the uh, total square footage of the Minnes building is 73,480 uh, square feet. Correct. So would it be fair to say that the North Hall building has greater capacity to absorb the additional students? Yes. <laughs> now we also talked about declining enrollment. Uh, again, since the 2021-22 school year, Indus has experienced a decline in enrollment of 13 students or 13 percent of the student population. And that's exhibit 4 p correct? Correct. <coughs> In, in addition, during that same period, Indus has experienced a decline in enrollment of resident students of 12 or 41 percent of its resident students, correct? Correct. Now, during that same period, North Home has not experienced any decline in, in its overall uh, including both resident and non-resident students. Correct. And that's Exhibit 4, page 7. In addition, during that same period, North Home has experienced a declining enrollment of resident students of two students to two percent of its resident students. And that's in the exhibit four page, uh, I this nine and exhibit 25, correct? Correct. Thus, it occurs that the declining enrollment is primarily uh, due to Indus, not North Home. Correct. What about transportation? Now we already indicated that this two schools are abiding in the lines of power. Yes. So if one of the schools is closed, the school district is going to have to provide transportation of those students to the other to the other school. The school district is legally obligated to provide transportation, correct? So if the in the school closes, and we assume that all the current in the students don't either open and go into another school district, or those who are currently open and roll into Indus do not return to their resident district, which currently comprise over 82% of the students attending Indus, the school district would need to transport 88 students to North K-12, correct. K-12. And that is a approximately a 90-minute ride from one road. Correct. refer you to page 40 and 41 of the Now, a 90 minute bus ride is not uncommon for the school district, is it? It's not ideal, but it is not uncommon, correct? And in fact, according to uh, page 40 and 41 of Exhibit 4, there are um, 18 North Pole students who already spent anywhere from 80 to 91 minutes traveling one way on the school bus. Correct. Now, if North Pole closes, and again, we make the same assumptions that the current North Pole students don't open the roll to another school district, or those who are currently in roll, open roll rather in North Pole, which is approximately 50% of the students attending North Pole, the school district would need to transport 177 students to North Pole, uh, to uh, in this correct? Correct. So, would it be fair to say that the transportation cost of, of transporting 177 students would be significantly greater than the transportation cost of transporting 88 students? Yes. Now, we also have comparative cost savings. And I want to refer you 
to pages, uh, page 41 and page 42 of Exhibit 4. Now, you indicate in there that if the, using the expenditures of uh, uh, 
Yes. I'm going to refer you to Exhibit 10, which again is the minutes of the June 17, 2020 school board. Okay, yes. And you are indicated that you're president. Yes. Uh, well, actually, this, this is the agenda. And again, the further reason was to discuss in this elementary involvement in teachers. Correct. Now, I want to refer you now to School District Exhibit 17, which is the minutes of that meeting. So the purpose was to try to reduce expenditures. Correct. And the board was provided with information that the, the, the district had been had deficit spent for I believe seven years prior to that. Yes. And that's in Exhibit 10. Yes. that were brought at that meeting, which was for the purpose of trying to reduce expenses. Uh, there were two motions, both of which failed. Uh, one was to add or bring back two teachers. And the other one was to bring back only one teacher. Correct. Now, I, I, I don't know. Now, the first motion to bring back two teachers was made by Teresa Brad and seconded by Scott. And where are those board members from the North Pole area or the in this area? In this area. And the second motion was made by Rolf Lewis and seconded by Scott. Where, where, where are those? Were they from the in this area or the in this area? So the discussion was to reduce expenditures, and the only motions that were made were to, to bring back or, or add a couple of teachers. Does that reduce expenditures? No. In fact, it does exactly the opposite, does it? Correct. Now, there was a works, I want to refer you to exhibit 19. Yes. And I'm just going to pick out a few for illustrative purposes. 
Uh, in this, for kindergarten, is five students. Correct. North Home is 11. Correct. First grade in this is four. Correct? Yes. North Home is 11. Yes. Second grade for Indus is seven students. Second grade for North Home is 10. Correct. Third grade for Indus is two, and third grade for North Home is 12. Yes. So at any point, was there any action taken to combine elementary classes at Indus because of the, the small number of students? Yes, that happened during the summer of 2020. And that was prior to the, the fiscal year, you said the summer of 2020, so that would have been for the 2021 school year? For the 2020-2021 school year, correct. Okay, sir. Um, and that was the year that you used to calculate the cost savings, uh, or, or excuse me, to, to calculate the, the amounts of um, educated students in, 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 in the role in this in North Home, which are found on pages 19 and 20 of Exhibit 4. Correct. So after, after doing that, the, the Indus School District was still, it was still costing over $6,000 per student over the cost of the school. We'll, we'll probably hear some more tonight, but certain arguments that have been put forward uh, by individuals who, who oppose uh, closing the end of school. And one of them that has been mentioned is going to a four-day school. Yes. Okay. Now, in order to do that, you have to get the approval of the MD, correct? Right? That's correct. And I want to refer you to Exhibit 20. No. Why? 
think there were, there were issues with, with students not being able to be with their peers. Um, also, students having connectivity issues. Um, maybe even, uh, you know, the teacher access along with the students sometimes wasn't applicable, um, where students were showing up on time, or I know parents were frustrated at times trying to direct students to get on their device or get into their um, online class. So I think it was a struggle for everyone involved. Now I want to refer you to School District Exhibit 12. And that's a copy of the September 21, 2022 Mustang Express. Okay? Yes. And I know that, that uh, just a certain portion of this has been cited by some of the opponents to closing the end of school. And the portion that's been cited is, now this, and I'm talking about the article, it says, Kennedy addresses the state of the district. And that was written by you. Yes. And the first paragraph, it starts with, currently the district has a fairly healthy fund balance for savings account. Our last audit for fiscal year 21, um, stated our undesigned fund balance was a little over $4 million. The fiscal year 22 audit is not complete as of this year. Yep. Correct. You wrote that. Yes. And so the, the, what, what they're, they're basically relying on is your statement that the district has a fairly healthy fund balance. Yes. But if you read the rest of the article, you then go through all the issues that the school district has, um, that the fund balance is shrinking. Yes. And the deficit spending. Yes. And you, you, you refer to, uh, you finally say, with this information, you're talking about the, 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 the deficit spending, um, with this information, I am working with the principals and the board to look at doing whatever we can to reduce expenditures. Correct. And in fact, after, after the, the information that came out after this article was written, indicates, would you, would you call? Uh, would you now say that the district has a fairly healthy fund balance for seeing? No. Okay, that, that I think is, unless you want to add anything else. I do not. Thank you. All right, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, we are at the time now where we are going to take public comments. I can't hear you. Okay, you, won't, you don't have to hear me, you're going to make comments yourself. So. <laughs> so, I have a list. Okay. And we're going to start with Scott May. Hi. Scott May. I said before, I'm putting everyone uh, five, minutes. five minutes or less. I'll make it short and sweet. There's more important right, than me. As you know, I am Scott and I am also a school board member here. Now, I swore an oath and I took a vow for the education, safety, and well being of the students of ISD 363. And that includes North Home and in this. And Looking at this community, you talk about population declining. If you close this school, that's not gonna help that issue at all whatsoever. It's gonna make it worse because now there's less of an incentive to move into this rural area. That's a thought. You say projected, Mr. Tammy. Assuming, guessing, that's not concrete. You're putting a lot of lives on the line for assuming and guessing and projecting. <laughs> That's just some of the things that I had in my head. 
you talk about general maintenance and buildings and things like that. These schools are 40 years old plus. That happens, it's cost. It's like running equipment. We have maintenance issues and breakdowns. Hours on machinery. All of a sudden there's costs. That happens. The thing that gets me the most is it feels like we weren't able to come up with options before this all hit the floor. Let's fight, let's see what we got, let's see what we can do. All of a sudden it's a vote to close the schools. Like, wow, that hits kind of hard. This entire community is affected, I'm affected. My business is affected if nobody shows up for employees. It's not just the school and the school employees that's gonna get hit here. It's all of us in the community. Well, that'll shut up. Thank you very much. Heather Clemency. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Heather Clementson. I am a proud graduate of the Indus School 2011. After graduation, I completed my Master of Science in Psychology, gained licensure in the state of Minnesota as a drug and alcohol counselor, as well as a professional clinical counselor in mental health. It is from this expertise in mental health I would like to offer testimony as to the imminent effects of closing the Indus School in haste and without proper precaution in place. I've compiled research in various areas that pertain to closure of the Indus School and the impact on the community and current and future student bodies. Indus School is defined as a rural school. Rurality is to be embraced and supported. It should be viewed in a human rights and social justice context, not as something to be improved upon in an attempt to overcome its shortfalls. The Indus School, among other rural schools, serves as an important marker of social and economic viability. Just a short list of economic impacts listed in the literature reviewed include loss of employment opportunities, both for Indus and North Home schools, loss of potential source of customers for ISD 363 stores. Students bused to North Home will add a new cost and many students will not be able to attend after school employment opportunities with the increased bus time impacting our local businesses that need student employees. Recapture of locally collected taxes and maintenance of property should also be considered that were not outlined. I'd like to focus on the implications for students. Small school environments such as Indus School provide more favorable academic and social outcomes. It's well documented in the North American literature. Our students are able to enter into more meaningful and productive relationships with peers and teachers, fostering higher levels of participation and engagement. Our students are more likely to engage in responsible and constructive community action as well. I would like to address the 90 minute bus ride. I reviewed the research and I would like to offer this information. Too often, in the absence of systematic research, school leaders consider only the practicalities of bus rides rather than considering the effects of bus rides on students' school performance and home lives. Extended travel to and from school by bus impacts students academically, socially, and physically. It's, be it's um, documented by Bennett, 2013, Smitherman, 1982, and Thompson, 1982. Long periods of travel affect students' ability to focus and concentrate for extended periods during the school day, shorten available hours for homework completion, discourage or prevent extracurricular involvement outside of school hours, and do not allow for the time necessary to pursue part-time employment. I quote directly from the literature, the joy of childhood is being stolen from rural students when attendance consolidated schools requires long bus rides, Bennett, 2013. I offer this data because I do not believe it is necessary to close the end of school. Only economics were considered. On yet another note, should our students be asked to transfer schools, I believe it is imperative the board and court have information on implications for transfer students. <clears throat> the, 
there is a correlation of transfer students and subsequent dropout rates. It is supported by significant amounts of research that transferring schools has a significant correlation. This applies to the closure of Indus School. Many testimonials will outline that there was a transfer to Indus that, met, that better met their emotional, social, and academic needs. We can predict requiring our students to transfer back to schools they have already transferred out of will make this research applicable tenfold. In general, the dropout rate for youth who stay in the same high school is 8.1%. The dropout rate for youth who attend two high schools or one transfer is over twice that at 19.1%. Our students who would be required to transfer a third, fourth, or fifth time will have a dropout rate of 25.9 to 29.5 percent. 25 to 30 of our students will likely drop out should they be required to transfer. Knowing that many of our students are already transfer students from local district options that, that did not meet their various needs, it is likely the rate of dropout will be even higher than this statistic. I would like to offer that nearly one half of all high school dropout ages, 16 to 24, are jobless. They earn about $9,245 less per year than high school graduates. Nearly half of all heads of household on the welfare and two thirds of prison inmates have not received a high school diploma. The cost of dropping out of high school is associated and its associated ills fall not only on the individual high school dropout but on the rest of society. It is estimated that the lifetime cost to the nation is $260,000 per dropout. Rue C. 2000. You're at five. I'll give you another 30 seconds. Okay. Um, lastly, and unfortunately, I would like to offer research on bullying and suicide rates. Based on our students transferring and moving into a, a social environment that they already transferred out of, you can expect our suicide rates to increase as well. We will literally be losing members of our society. Joe Strauss. Joe Strauss? I don't think he's here. Okay. Joe? Ask Margaret? Joe here? Thank you. Joe. Everything you guys bring in will be entered into the record. Thank you. So feel free. All right. I'm Jill Hasbargen, parent, taxpayer, community member, teacher, mental health professional licensed elementary uh, teacher K through six and I am still employed by this district. I watched the March 8th board meeting online from my home and I watched in disbelief as four North Home board members took it upon themselves to vote to pursue permanently closing the Indus school without any prior communication or knowledge to anyone on the Indus end of the district. My husband and 17 year old daughter were in attendance at that same meeting. The vote was made swiftly and coldly without any discussion or questioning. I, along with everyone on the Indus end, were stunned by this de decision. The agenda had only been posted online the weekend before, or the weekend before the Wednesday night board meeting, and it was on that agenda, when that agenda was shared on Facebook, that I first noticed option three, close North Home, and option four, close Indus. I've been employed with the district since August of 2000, and this was the first time I've ever seen such an option proposed. My daughter came home from the meeting heartbroken. Her senior year had just been ripped away from her in a cruel, cold, evil act by four people who she's never even met before or seen. The four North Home board members refused to make eye contact with anyone at Indus, including the students. They requested police presence and an escort out the door to their cars after the meeting, Never in history of the district had this been requested in the past. My, da my daughter has been with Indus since age three. She's worked her entire life to get what she deserves going into her senior year. All those opportunities are now ripped away with no explanation and no discussion. Lost opportunities include sports. Now she will have to sit her senior year. As the rules state, all transfers are ineligible for competition. Scholarships gone, senior class president, senior class trip, senior prom, homecoming, graduating with all of her friends, and graduating from Indus. 
Two students in her class will now lose the opportunity to be valedictorian and salutatorian. Every hope and dream for the Indus seniors of 2024 gone. She was, would also be the fourth generation in her family to graduate from Indus. These opportunities have now been stolen, her dreams destroyed and her hopes shattered. All by people she's never met or seen before. In fact, the only person from the North Home Board that I've ever met before tonight is Bob Steuben, and that was only at past board meetings, and I worked at the district for over 20 years. I sent all six board members an option five before the March 8th meeting, but they ignored it. Ralph Lewis made a motion to look at other options. The four North Home Board members would not discuss this option, and it was instantaneously voted down. I sent every board member and the superintendent a question through email March 17th asking what their plan was for educating the Indus student body if they close. I got no response. I asked three, time for Doug, three times for Doug Jordan's phone number. Again, I got no response. My husband called Bob Steuben, and he refused to discuss anything with him. Aren't board members supposed to be working for the good of everyone in the district, including parents and students? This is not the case with this group of representatives. Beyond a daughter, I have nieces, cousins, many past students directly affected by this cruel, heartless decision who each have plans to graduate from Indus. The North Home kids do not have to endure the mental health strife our kids are currently exp experiencing because closing North Home was never really an option, though it was added so it looks like it was considered. Quite obviously, it was not. That's why nobody in North Home came to the board meeting, except for one person who talked, and they were worried about Indus. The, the disruption this has caused Indus students, parents, staff, teachers, staff, taxpayers, and concerned community members is immense. The mental health effects on our students are just beginning, though they are already significant. These kids were just starting to get their feet back under them in the educational realm when four adults from North Home took it upon themselves to rip the carpet out from under them once again. The reason North Home community members are saying that they voted to close the Indus school is because if they don't, it might hurt the North Home students because Indus costs way too much money to operate. Do the four North Home board members not realize we are part of the same district? Do they not, do, do our kids honestly not matter because you don't know them? Do we as parents honestly not matter? It is true that Indus only has 25% of our students that live within the district, but the other 75% of our student body choose to come to Indus because it's a better school for them, and that should speak volumes. graduate of Indus and owner of Jake's Sawmill in Bidette, Minnesota. I am a resident of Independent School District 363. My daughter would be a 2024 graduate of Indus High School if it still exists next year. I reached out to Nathan Heibel, Kuchigan County Land Commissioner, and you prepared the following two documents to help explain how CONCON funding and tax forfeited trust fund apportionment worked. Those are the documents I gave you. Additionally, Kuchigan County provided an accounting of funds paid to ISDs since 2018. Right On March 8th, Superintendent of Indus School District 363 presented four options for the board to consider reducing cost. An eight page document was read at the board meeting supported only, supporting only one option closure of the Indus school. It contains inaccurate information, specifically the county timber and CONCON estimated revenue was decreased from 650 to 450,000. However, this was inaccurate. The documents from the Kuching County Land Commissioner show that the actual amount from CONCON and forfeited timber sales was 
421.708 and 159.984, which equaled 581.692. This is a difference of $131,692 more than projected on page 8 of the document. When you consider the eight-page document, which is very inadequate and hard to understand, it projects a 391,784 deficit. The additional money from Kuchkin County reduce, reduces the superintendent's own projection, projected deficit to $260,092. The Rainy River Gazette published the amounts a few days after the March 8th meeting, which could have been added in. The board couldn't wait the month for the actual funds of Kuchkin County would pay forest funds would pay in forestry fund funding to come. It just it was just like it won't, won't wait won't wait for the, just like it wouldn't wait for the legislature to determine the amount that will be passed provided providing additional funding to the school. This is not about funding. If it were, they would wait to see how much, if any deficit there would be until after all the funding has come in. Even taking the numbers in the eight page report at face value, even when there are so many questionable numbers, the unsigned funding balance of 1.8 million would last almost seven years before statutory operating debt. 1.8 million divided by 260. This is again without any funding, new funding from the legislature. The school board has failed to show that it has that it is necessary and practical to close into school. There are their own reports numbers just do not add up and raise more questions than answers. Thank you. Thank you. I am currently a junior at Indus School. Next school year, 2023 20, to 24, I will be a senior. I have been going to Indus since preschool. One of my main concerns about this school closure is sports. I play two school sports, volleyball and softball. I am currently a varsity player in the starting lineup for both. And next school year, I will be a volleyball captain. If the school were to close and I were to go to North Home, would I still be a volleyball starter? Would I still get the opportunity to be captain? If so, would that bump one of North Home's players off of the starting lineup? If going to North Home ends up not being an option because of the two hour commute one way from my house or the four hour commute both ways, I would have to go to another school such as International Falls which poses another issue. Per Minnesota State High School League rules, when a student above the ninth grade transfers schools, they are ineligible for varsity athletic competition at their new school for one year. That means I would not be able to be able to play sports my senior year, which makes getting recruited and getting athletic scholarships for college impossible. Another issue that doesn't just affect me, all of the sports at Indus are free. Sports at other schools are not. For example, sports at International Falls, depending on the sport, can be anywhere from $75 to $87 per athlete. Some other things I will be losing out on are the chance to be valedictorian. With our small class size, I have a high chance of being valedictorian. Whereas at a bigger school, I would have a small chance. The opportunity to be senior class president, which I currently am, I will miss out on my senior class trip. Keep in mind, we have been planning and raising money for this class trip since sixth grade. I will no longer be able to graduate from Indus. I would have been the fourth generation of my family to graduate from here. I will miss out on numerous academic scholarships that are specific to the Indus school. I will miss out on my senior prom. My last prom with all of my friends who have became my family after all of these years. Which brings me to my last point. If you close Indus, you will be breaking up a family. 
So closing the Indus School is not necessary nor practical for my class, my peers, and myself. So please, reconsider the decision to ruin my senior year. Thank you. Catherine Nelson. Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Nelson. I live in Birchdale. I attended Indus K-12, through graduated in 94. I'm a third generation graduate and a third generation employee. My grandma cooked and cleaned here. My mom drove bus here for 43 years. And I've worked the night custodian job here for five years now. I started as summer help and I've made it my mission to paint the interior of the building. And it's looking pretty good. Uh, we have a beautiful building and we take very good care of it. We appreciate it very much. Even the students respect the building, which you don't see that very often. I don't deal with valid vandalism as a custodian. We don't have vandalism in this school. Our students yeah. respect our building. <laughs> Indus is part of a small community that never had much of a population, but it is a physical place and organization where people meet and interact. Indus serves as a food pantry, a community education classroom, a sporting event venue, and the school holds the history and culture of this place through yearbooks, trophy cases, and photo archives. All of these are minor compared to the feeling of safety, security, and love that I feel every time I walk through the door. Most school boards are in one community and in charge of the schools in that community. In those districts, the school board works to make sure the community does not suffer when the school needs to close. Unfortunately, our school district is made of two very distinct, very different communities where there is little op op uh, opportunity to interact or even to meet each other. We don't grocery shop in the same places, they're 80 miles away. We don't run into each other. Um, our board members are elected at large, which means that all of the board members should be working hard to find solutions to the current issues and keeping all of our students in the district cared for and educated. Bus rides when I went to school were 45 minutes tops, and that was considered a long trip for a little kid. Imagine being a first grader and having to get on a bus at 6 a.m. to make less than 20 stops and make it to school by 8.30. That's two and a half hours one way. Five hours a day. You can totally forget about sports, National Honor Society, anything. There's no time. Um, one thing that we've heard as a solution is remote learning. That's not a possibility here. We're too rural. Uh, we contacted several different internet providers. It's not available high speed other than right on Highway 11. Anywhere else, you can't, the satellite's not dependable and it's too much, it's too much of a cost. $300, I heard, was the equipment and an additional $100 per month just for a house that's a mile off the highway to have internet. It's not feasible for our kids. Uh, busing, oh, I covered that. So if busing and remote learning aren't an option, how can you close a school and still pretend you care about all the students in the district? Closing this school will affect real estate values as no sane person would buy a house over 50 miles from their child's school. All real estate purchase would have to have disclosures that there aren't any schools in the area for their children to attend. It would affect the new food pantry, the livelihoods of 40 people, and the future of our beloved community. Everything I've read, and I've read a lot, recommends a much longer study period, more data, transportation costs, maintenance costs, and more. I believe a district considering closing a school should know what schools you've identified to send these children to. I'm just asking you to consider all these issues before deciding what to do. Thank you.
have a father-in-law that was a superintendent of schools in Greendale, Wisconsin. And um, he would probably be rolling over in his grave right now because of what's going on. Because as a community, we need to work together. As a, it's no different than hiring a senator to work for us. We all, you need people that work for us, the community. I'm a Christian that believes in the golden rule, which we try and teach our kids when they start out in school, that in everything you do unto others, what you'd have them do to us. And this rule of conduct is a summary of the Christian's duty to his neighbor and a fundamental ethical principle. I happen to be the neighbor right across the road here. If you go out on the playground, that's my property. So this concerns me immensely, the possibility that this school could be shut down. Um, we have about 150 acres, which we pay about $2,500 a year in property taxes. And about $600 of that goes directly to support School District 363. Um, and that increased by $135 since 2022. Um, I'm a concerned citizen. I graduated from Indus. I have had brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, and cousins that have graduated. And currently my 14-year-old grandson attends by choice. He, he could go to the International Falls School, but he has excelled here. I mean, he excelled in International Falls. But he's learning things here at this small school that he wouldn't have been able to learn as quickly as if he was going to Indus because he's been able to go to the shop class that Sorn teaches. Um, he's learned all kinds of tools for, um, you know, for the future. And some people will say this is a school for losers, for kids that can't fit in otherwise. And I say it's a school for these kids, any kid, to have opportunities in life because there are some people that would have committed suicide or dropped out of school if they didn't come here. And thank you very much. Can I please? As the mother of the Secretary of Indus and a great grandmother of an Indus student, I'm opposed to the closing of Indus. Indus is an outdoor magnet school providing a unique learning environment, encouraging students to plant, harvest, grow produce, and acquire agricultural knowledge, while staying true to the fundamentals and solid core academics and capitalizing on its location to provide optimal hands-on learning. Students are provided opportunities to partake in facts, industrial art and technology, pro start, and home repair. Through collaboration with local colleges, students have options to pursue PSEO and a variety of trade school certifications that fulfill high school credits and trade school practice requirements. Through their course offerings and college collaboration, the school embodies the Minnesota vision providing long-term benefits to the state in meeting the skilled workers' shortage, among other things. Studies also focus on Minnesota history and culture. I fail to see the school board presenting any substantial evidence or any necessary or practical reasons for the closing of the school. The financial concerns of the school board, which are in question and not sufficient when it's weighed against the educational and emotional impact on the students. The simple threat of closing the school has had a tremendous emotional impact on the students and staff. Based with being separated from the bonds that they've made with other students and staff, being forced into a new environment, a new school, a school where they're not, quite often not wanted, has resulted in students becoming depressed, showing aggressive behavior, and even physical symptoms that affect their home life, causing family turmoil. The proposed closing 
is causing anxiety and stress to the staff due to their concern for the welfare of their students as well as their jobs. For Indus, it's not only a school, it's a family. It's an established fact that a student with an emotional disturbance has an inability to learn in school, which cannot be explained by other factors, as well as the inability to build or maintain good relations in school. The school board's hasty decision to close Indus without pursuing all available options or employing the aid of the community to forestall closing shows a failure to uphold their oath of office. As board members, you are supposed to, quote, serve as education's key advocate to, on behalf of students in our community schools to advance the vision of our schools, end of quote. As community leaders, the school board should serve as the voice of the community in public education and listen and respond to citizens' inquiries. Sue state and federal support for the district. The board is accountable for the district's performance, constant communication between the board and the community, which this board has failed to do. Please uphold your oath of office and keep in this open. Hi, I'm Bruce Turbin, a uh, resident of Birchdale. I keep hearing that uh, this decision was not taken lightly. To me, that would imply that they have exhausted all reasonable efforts to avoid the devastating impact that closing into school will have on students, parents, faculty, and the community. That would imply they have had lengthy discussions at official school meetings, and as far as we know, they've had really no discussions amongst board members at official meetings. That would also imply that they have a plan for what happens with our school building. Do we have a plan or are we just pulling the plug? And if not, has there been a study prepared? What are the costs of that going to be? I haven't heard anything about that. Again, no open discussions. Students, parents, faculty, and community concerns have also not been addressed publicly. What's the rush? The only reason offered from the North Home Board members concerning their vote was the finances. Consider this, two of these board members were just sworn in in January and almost their first action as board members was to close the school. I read their meet the candidate statements. They both declared their intentions to support a quality education for the students, yet their only consideration they cite for this decision is finances? Therefore, the devastating effects of closing the end of school on our students' educational opportunities and mental health, not to mention impacts to parents, faculty, community, and surrounding school districts, was not a consideration in their decision? Shame on you if that's the case. What about the finances? We agree the district faces challenges, but this is not the first time a funding deficit has been projected in February. What usually happens next is the board collaborates to find a solution and, and, and we move on. The state is poised to deliver significant funding help to all districts, and no, I don't agree with all their uh, adding and subtracting that ends up amounting to almost zero money we're going to get. I don't buy that. The Minnesota Department of Education is standing by to assist in finding a solution. Why don't we just wait until the session is over to see where we actually stand? Again, what's the rush? According to a school closure guide that I've carefully studied, closing a school in six months or less is never considered. A minimum of 12 months is required with 18 months being op optimal. This closure isn't typical. We are not simply closing a building 
and moving the students to another facility within the district, even though that's what you suggest. They're simply proposing we get rid of a school, its students, faculty, and leave it up to others to pick up the pieces, as they have no real viable solution to offer within the district. Because of, all, because of this, I feel even more time would be appropriate to arrive at a solution that would work for all. In closing, I'd like to say my feeling is that this decision pretty much happened because they gained a, another school board member. It feels mean-spirited mean and selfish. Does anyone here really believe that they are here tonight to consider our concerns or altering their course? I don't. I believe they're only here to check another legal box in their quest to get rid of us. They may as well be sitting there with their fingers in their ears going la 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 la. <laughs> that said, I also believe the majority of North Home residents are fine people that given a chance would support a spirit of cooperation among board members for all students' benefits. Please give us the time and opportunity to work with you not against you, to find a solution that would work for all of our students. Thank you. Members, uh, thank you for being here. Superintendent, uh, thank you for the math class. Uh, <laughs> Deanne, I'm glad you could make it. This is a, it's a wonderful place, and I think uh, most of the things that I had thought about chatting about tonight, uh, maybe one of the most important is, is you can go through every school district in the whole state. And there's no school like this one. None. Yeah, yeah right. I want to tell you about a little boy that went to school here. And he had a, a very difficult time. He, he couldn't even be average. I know when he went home, his father would tell him, you know, it's okay to be average. And you just got to kind of work a little bit harder. And when that boy walked out of these doors, he was a straight-A student. He, he uh, works for Voyagers National Park. He's, he sells real estate. He's a volunteer fireman. That little boy is my son. So I know it works. And I know that the children that come here from other school districts uh, don't always have the opportunities that they had in other schools. And it, it, it adds up here for small classes. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Mike Hansen. I was an employee at the end of school to, be, to get it out front. I uh, was six years on the school district here and a past chairman. I'm a taxpayer, uh, four terms on the Cushing County Board of Commissioners. I represent both North Home and this area. I'm the Vice President of North Star Electric Co-op who serves the electrons to this school. It's a big deal for them to have this school here. And I'm currently the Vice President of Cushing Economic Development Authority and I represent the entire rural area of Cushing, including North Home and Indus. And I, other than to tell you that there's no other school like this in Minnesota, sir, there, there's one other thing, and it's important, and it's the tipping point. And it's the tipping point of not just this school, but the whole northwestern part of Cushing County. When I was a boy, there were seven stores between Birchdale, Minnesota, where I live, and, and uh, International Falls. And now there's one. And when this school goes down, there's going to be none. I don't know of anybody that wants to drive 30 or 40 miles for a quart of milk. But that's what they'll have to do. And not just for that quart of milk, that's where they're going to have to go to work, drive 30 or 40 miles. So we want to give some consideration into some alternatives. And uh, sir, uh, I know that there's a lot of people in this room that would go out of their way and work hard to see if there are any other alternatives. Thanks. Thank you. 